Hi, I'm Karina Rambide, a PhD student from the University of Waterloo in the Department of Systems Design Engineering. I'm also part of the HCI Games Group and the Games Institute. Hi, and I'm Leonard Nacke, an Associate Professor and Director of the HCI Games Group at the Games Institute and the Stratford School of Interaction Design and Business. This is at the University of Waterloo. Today, we want to welcome you to our talk about player traits and the player traits model that measures player preferences for five different styles of gameplay. Now, people can complete this survey to get scored on five different traits or gameplay style orientations, social, narrative, goal, challenge, and aesthetic orientation. In our presentation today, we want to talk about the development of a trait model and scale of gameplay and preferences that our colleague, Gustavo Tondello, a former PhD student at the University of Waterloo, developed with us. Gustavo is a senior software engineer and gamification expert who wrote his thesis about personalizing gameful design. Typology models for players categorize different motivations and behaviors, and they are necessary to design personalized experiences or target specific audiences. Previous research has tried to standardize these categories, but they lack validation. With our work, we tried to synthesize previous review and literature of player traits. First, we will describe the five player traits. Then, we will present the measurement scale and how it relates with other models. Finally, we will describe different applications of the player traits. Now, there's previous work related to player preferences, and that includes the work of Richard Bartle. Now, Bartle uh, explained the psychology of the player in four categories. Uh, so he was talking about achievers, and then he was talking about explorers, and socializers and killers. Uh, achievers are the ones that focus on points and status in the game. Explorers are discovering new things, want to see the game world. Socializers are interested in interacting and collaborating with other players. And killers are similar to achievers in a way of earning points and improving their status. But the main difference is that they want to see other players lose. Now, this wasn't the only thing that Bartle talked about. He also later expanded his model and turned it into uh, sort of these eight different uh, dimensions that you can see here, um, where he added, uh, or the three different dimensions that you can see here. Um, Bartle essentially turned it into eight players and he added opportunists, which are implicit achievers, planners, which are explicit achievers, scientists, which are explicit explorers, hackers, which are implicit explorers, and networkers, which are explicit socializers, and friends, which are implicit socializers, griefers, which are implicit killers, and politicians, which are explicit killers. So he developed these eight types as an expansion of the four types that everyone seems to know about. Following Bartle's work, BrainHex was developed, and BrainHex is a player model that describes game behavior using seven different classes. And it is the Seeker, Survivor, Daredevil, Mastermind, Conqueror, Socializer, and Achiever. However, other player models about traits and preferences have been developed as well, and some of these models have issues uh, that are generally present with type models uh, specifically. For example, some players uh, normally just don't enjoy just one type of experience um, or uh, they are only presenting a specific type of traits. Uh, so it's difficult to obtain valid results from these models. Furthermore, some of these existing scales lack a validation or they're notoriously unreliable. As a caveat to our own scale that we're presenting here, I had a talk with Ben from Epic Games about a year ago uh, about using the scale to study Fortnite players, and he had trouble in this factor analysis with the challenge and social orientation dimensions of our scale as well. So any developed model really needs to be validated in different contexts and should really be uh, taken with a bit of a grain of salt in terms of um, overall validity for all different types of games. So it's important if you want to apply this uh, in studies for your own game uh, to uh, run the study and run a factor analysis after. And then, of course, if you want these results to kind of inform our theory building, it's nice to share that back with academia and then allow academia to refine the model. Um, we're really kind of pushing this forward as an initial um, an endeavor for understanding how uh, these different player traits actually work. Uh, so our hope is to improve our understanding for personalization of these player traits within different game contexts. 
BrainHex was an interim model that provided the grounds to develop a definitive player traits model. Based on that research, our work presents a validated scale recognizing that players' preferences are not always just explained by a simple categorization, but they are composed by a combination of different characteristics and traits. We present five different player traits with our work. The first player trait relates to social orientation. Players who score high on the social orientation scale prefer to play together with others, enjoy multiplayer games and competitive gaming communities. Players who score low prefer to play alone. Aesthetic orientation represent players who enjoy aesthetic experiences in games, such as exploring the world, enjoying the scenery, appreciating the graphics, sound, and art style. Players who score low in this scale tend to focus more on gameplay than the aesthetics of the game. Players who score high in the narrative orientation enjoy complex narratives and stories within games. Players who score low prefer games with less story and might skip the story or cutscenes when those get in the way of gameplay. Challenge orientation represents players who prefer difficult games and hard challenges. Players who score low in this scale prefer easier or casual games. Finally, goal orientation represents players who enjoy completing game goals and like to complete games 100%, explore all the options and complete all quests and collections. Players scoring low might leave optional quests or achievements unfinished. We propose our five trade model to address building blocks of actionable game design. To validate our scale, we investigated if the described player traits correspond to participants' preferences for different elements of gaming. So how did we create the measurement scale? So we created the scale with 25 Likert style items, five items per trade. And we validated the scale with an exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis and test retest reliability. As you can see here, this is how the scale comes. Uh, you have essentially the five items, social, aesthetic, narrative, challenge, and goal orientation. And each of the items has five Likert style items. Some of the items have reverse scoring attached to them. Um, and then you factor the items together. And ideally, you would uh, then get a reliable result uh, for your uh, player trait that is uh, visible in the players of your games. Now, it was developed in four, uh, in two phases with four researchers, and we used some sort of brainstorming approach to generate the tentative items that we had at the start. Then we studied the description of the five player traits based on um, our own previous work and a literature review of uh, the prior player typologies that were out there. And after that, each researcher wrote the suggested items that could be applied to score someone on a specific trade. And um, in the second phase, the items were then put together and the researchers collectively selected those that seemed to be the best. And in the end, the 10 items uh, per trade that received the highest amount of votes were included in the survey. And um, you can, again, see the complete list of items uh, here in, in the background um, as we settled on five items per trade in the very end. And the participants for this were uh, recruited to social media and mailing lists, and we included the data set of 332 responses. And participants were between 15 and 57 years old, and it included participants from all continents. And if you want more information about this, you can go to our website, hcigames.com slash player minus traits, and you'll be able to uh, find that information. You'll be able to find the um, the, the, the list uh, of the items and the scoring instructions and all that. Uh, so you're able to try it out for yourself, uh, see if the factor analysis holds for your individual example. We would love to um, get shared data. I know that's not always possible in industry, but we're really excited uh, for this to be out there and for this to be tested by other people working with games and to see whether or not this actually has an impact on uh, an understanding of the player traits that are out there uh, for people. So we're hoping that this is the case and we're hoping that there is uh, a usefulness to the scale as you're deploying it in your own research. To present our results, first we talk about the initial factor analysis used to validate the trait structure and to select the best five survey items per trait. 
we conducted an initial factor analysis with 175 responses to validate the traits and reduce the number of items. The goal was to keep only the needed amount of items with sufficient reliability. Our work included 10 items per factor. After conducting the analysis, we decided to keep five items per trait. The final survey contains 25 items. After selecting the final five items per trait, we conducted a confirmatory factor analysis with the second half of the data set that had 157 responses. The analysis indicates good discriminant validity, meaning that the traits are sufficiently different from each other. Subsequently, a test a retest reliability of the 25 item scale was calculated to ensure it leads to similar scores each time a participant completes the survey. The results indicate that the scale is stable, meaning a person is likely to obtain similar scores each time they take it, provided they still have similar preferences. A descriptive analysis showed that aesthetic orientation and narrative orientation are the strongest player traits overall. A correlation analysis between traits and personality indicate that a negative correlation exists between narrative orientation and extroversion, indicated that more introverted players tend to enjoy games with strong narratives and stories. On the other hand, social orientation is correlated with extroversion and agreeablessness, indicated that extroverted and agreeable people would be more inclined to play together with others. In terms of correlations with game elements and game playing styles, findings indicate that significant correlations between aesthetic and narrative orientation with the role playing and simulation games are expected because these games normally focus on narrative and aesthetic experiences. Aesthetic is also correlated with virtual goods and action. Narrative orientation is negatively correlated with sports and cards, which makes sense considering these games usually have no story or narrative. The correlation between goal orientation with puzzle, role playing and virtual goods can be explained because these elements are based on setting goals for players. Correlations between social orientation with sports and cards, virtual goods and action are explained because these games have some element of player interaction. Finally, the correlation of challenge orientation with strategic resource management, puzzle and action is explained because these elements pose difficult challenges for players. So when talking about participants' preferences in terms of playing styles, there is a strong correlation between a social orientation and multiplayer gaming. This shouldn't come as a su surprise because several items of social orientation refer to playing together. So social orientation and multiplayer gaming is something that works together. Uh, we did see a correlation between aesthetic and narrative orientations with the solo playing activity. Now this is interesting because uh, solo playing uh, gives the player usually a little bit more space for immersion or a, just a different type of aesthetic immersion that they might be feeling. Uh, so this is an interesting thing uh, that just emerges from somebody playing by themselves. Uh, there might be a, a thing in there that people do experience a narrative differently um, if they're playing, let's say, an, an interactive story game just by themselves. Uh, the decision making becomes all about the player um, individually making that decision as they're going through that interactive narrative, whereas uh, this might not be the same case if you were in a multiplayer um, environment and then all of a sudden you have to make the decisions together or somebody else's decision influences your own decision so the uh, traversion through that is just a little bit different and, and that's something to keep in mind. Finally uh, we could say that the challenge orientation is negatively correlated with casual playing and this is interesting because uh, casual games offer shorter and less exp less challenging uh, gameplay in, in general. Uh, so they will be maybe less appreciated by players that seek challenging experiences. However, uh, it's positively co correlated with all of the other playing styles that are out there. So uh, one could say that challenge is important uh, in, in playing styles other than in, in casual playing styles. So casual playing styles maybe do not cater so much to uh, a player that uh, does prefer challenge in 
in their interactions. This is interesting if you're looking at the type of idle games that are out there um, or some semi-automatic games where you're just kind of checking in and the game kind of plays itself for a little bit. Um, these are very much at the, the height of the, the casual game activity that's out there. And it'd be interesting to kind of, you know, find out a little bit more about what that actually means uh, in terms of our enjoyment of these types of, of casual games versus our enjoyment of, of games that really kind of push us in terms of a boundary and they, they really kind of try to give us a little bit more um, of friction in terms of gameplay to overcome than some of these games that are essentially very frictionless and you're just kind of involved in, in some planning decisions there. So it'd be an interesting thing to study more about, but it's something that uh, popped up in our initial study of the different player traits that's out there and something that's interesting and important to note for people for sure. As with any academic work, uh, there are major takeaways from the study, and obviously some of the things are still uh, very early in the development, uh, but we feel confident that we have uh, introduced and created a new player traits model here that solved the, um, many of the issues that we've identified in previous work. Uh, so it's, it's really kind of key for us to address some of the shortcomings uh, that some of the previous scales had. And uh, we are pretty confident that we've addressed many of them. Uh, we've also contributed and created this 25 item measurement scale. And uh, that's, I think, a, a pretty useful thing. It's freely available on our, our website. Uh, you can use it in your own user research as you're embarking on uh, some testing about the types of players that are uh, enjoying your game and essentially identifying these player traits is a key to understanding the kind of demographic that you're engaging with. And we also showed that player traits are somewhat correlated and that they're different than personality traits. And I think that's important to note that a personality trait has a different influence on your playing style and your, your playing behavior than a player trait would. So a player trait really helps more in regards to this personalization bit if you wanted to try and personalize games towards these different playing styles that people did exhibit in our sample anyways. And so obviously uh, this is one of the things um, where we need to collect more data, but we're quite excited that we could show this and we showed that player traits are correlated to, and this is an interesting thing, preferred game elements and playing styles, right? So the traits, the game elements and the playing styles, they all had uh, different types of correlations. Yeah, you can go in depth in our paper and read up on all the details um, where we're describing how that all unfolded and uh, we would love for you uh, to check that out if you go to hcigames.com uh, slash player minus trades uh, you will be able to find all of that information on our website and we'd be happy to chat with you about anything related to this model as well so what are the applications of our player trades model we believe our player trades model can be used in different fields such as game design marketing and research the model can help select ideal participants for game tests by adding our 25 item scale to recruit potential play testers. It can help to better understand game tests according to participants' gaming preferences. Our scale can provide valuable information about participants' playing preferences. It can also help to give designers and game studios more accurate insights about their audience. For example, to explore different options when a studio wants to create a new game. And it can also help to target market campaigns to the right audience. Understanding our audience can help us create the right marketing campaign to attract more players. So I want to talk a bit about future work and future work for the model includes, of course, that we need to continue validating the scale with larger samples. That's really kind of key for um, understanding how the scale works uh, for different types of uh, players, for different types of games. It's really key to validate it in that way. But we also need to study correlations with other models that are out there. Uh, there's different types of models. Uh, we need to understand a better uh, way of correlating it with uh, personality models that are out there. 
Um, we need to maybe understand a little bit more about game design models and how it correlates with those. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities to study more in depth what those player traits can actually do and how they relate to other types of understanding of game playing. And then also we want to try and compare uh, the participant's self-reported preferences with their actual in-game behavior. That's really kind of key because as you know, there's always a little bit of a difference between what a participant will report, um, what they uh, what they feel like uh, engaging with, and then what they actually engage with in the game. And obviously for you, this will be something that you could easily do if you were to apply this in your company and you're um, applying it to the game that you're currently working on and be a, a wonderful opportunity to see is there actually uh, an, an, a relationship that you can see between how people engage with the game and how they said their preference works when it comes to engaging with different gameplay elements. And um, this is something that we haven't studied yet and we'd actually be excited to see some data for that. Again, um, we'll be studying it uh, with the limited resources that we have, but we're also always uh, excited to see what somebody else is doing there. And I know a lot of this cannot be shared, but uh, you know, be beautiful if maybe in some of the future games you are summits, uh, we would see some of these results shared or you know, we're always happy to work with people that uh, have the resources um, on this type of stuff. So, you know, excited to share this and hopefully uh, to see some collaborations in that space. That would be wonderful. If you would like to learn more about the model, please visit hcigames.com slash player dash traits. Additionally, we recently added several translations of this scale and instructions of its use. Don't hesitate to contact any of the researchers if you have any questions about their player traits model. And that's our new player traits model. Five orientations of players in games that help you understand whether they prefer different game elements or they prefer different play styles. That's the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So what do we do now? Um, yeah, usually I, uh, after these presentations are over, then uh, you go to a pub and you have a drink together. Can't really do that in a, in a virtual world. Can you now? Although I have a feeling that might be an option here. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. You later. Otherwise, I would just keep going with this for a long time. And I don't think we have that kind of time. It was good seeing you again virtually. Great. Thanks. Bye, everyone.